Hello, and welcome to Technically Speaking, where scientists and engineers come together to chat about a common interest, share knowledge, and satisfy some curiosity. I'm Antonia, and in this episode, I'm joined by Ellie and Laura to talk about using video to tell science stories and the experience of making documentaries. To start off with, Ellie, how did you get into this? Originally, I did a master's in wildlife documentary production, and in doing so, I made three of my own, uh, not very good, but slightly better by the end, student films, um, documentaries about wildlife and about like various aspects, but I did it all myself because it was student films. I didn't have a big production team, so I did all the filming myself, all the editing myself, sound design, the whole, the whole thing, as you can imagine. I did have help, but predominantly it was my film. And then from that, I went into working in television for a little while, but we're going to talk more about that in a bit. Wonderful. So from uh, student films to doing everything by yourself to now being a piece of a large production crew for TV. Cool. Can't wait to discuss that a little bit more. So Laura, you're you're a uh, jack of all trades in uh, science communication. <laughs> uh, so tell us a little bit more about any experience you've had with documentaries. Yeah, so I'm now a freelance science communicator. I've been doing that for just over a year now. And when I was interviewing someone for a different podcast, and I got uh, talking to them afterwards, after the interview, they were like, could we do a documentary? And I said, well, yeah, anything's possible. <laughs> Famous last words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, what I, what I didn't have necessarily was uh, the equipment to record a documentary to a high standard. So Ellie put me in touch with someone who could put a film crew together and a producer. And we flew out to Japan to record the experiments that these scientists were doing. And I think one of the things that really interests me in documentaries is that I really like learning. I like sharing knowledge and finding out new things, which is kind of why my whole career is I've just sort of bounced around from different science disciplines which is kind of what led me into freelancing, which I really enjoy because I get to learn things from other people. Yeah, that's great. So how long have you been freelancing for? Since April 2021. Does that sound right? Yeah, just over a year is what I said. That must make sense, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, more like 18 months now. I think it was around the time I started joining in, in the podcast. Yeah, so we started the podcast when I was still in my previous role in academia. You guys helped me transition really well because you gave me all this experience of how to interview people and how to start telling that science story. <laughs> you guys helped me in my career, which is great. I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. This podcast has been an interesting experience in translating what information I've read into a digestible format. It's so interesting what Laura said about story as well, like, that's what got drilled into us doing the documentary because a lot of us were scientists but what's important when you make a documentary is the story that's what's going to get people to watch so we had a little running joke that our lecturer would say oh don't forget about the story or make sure you're weaving in story elements but it was just story 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 the whole time like that's what you were really focusing on to tell the science and stuff to a wider audience. It's also one of those things, I remember my PhD supervisor talking about this as well, how, what story is your thesis telling, which I guess is where I first started to learn it. So obviously the thesis is like any science report that you'd write in school, but a lot bigger, where you start off with the introduction and the motivation, like why are you doing it, what are your aims, what's the background behind this, what have people done so far, and then what did you do, how did you do it, what extra knowledge does this add to the world? what can we conclude from that and I think the story in the documentary it can be similar mm. but then there's also like the human aspect of it as well like why do you have scientists doing science and what's their passion for it yeah so you can be a little bit freer with uh, the storyline that you're trying to put forward in a documentary you don't need all the, the nitty-gritty details necessarily of well I put my sample in here and then I did this and then I tweaked this setting and then I found that <laughs> Yeah. I just had visions of someone stood behind Laura. She played with buttons on a very complicated scientific machine in a lab. But yeah, we used to get that all the time. What are you going to see? Because obviously documentary is a visual medium. You have to be able to tell someone to convince them to give you money to make a documentary of what are we going to see? Why is this interesting? It's the same with your thesis. Yeah, to convince anything to, to go forward. And then more than that is to entertain people hopefully they'll enjoy it and tell their friends about it well that's the aim isn't it to sort of have people engaged and hope that they pick up some knowledge along the way absolutely 
So how do you go about figuring out what is the story? Because say from from an experiment or your entire thesis, for a PhD, you'd spend three years and then you've got to condense that into something cohesive. And for some of the wildlife documentaries as well, they could be filming, trying to find that one moment that, you know, say the lion finds its prey. How do you condense it into a story? What you said about the lion finding its prey, like lots of stories get scrapped because you need that one key money shot, that one key element. And if you don't have that, you can hardly film a lion hunt without having the lion, you know, hunting. You need that sequence to show what's happening. So, I mean, there is a slog and there'll be a lot of prior research for any of those big wildlife documentaries to go into it. They'll go knowing that this is what they're likely to see. And if they talk to locals or they talk to experts or researchers or whoever, they can put them in the right place at the right time to hopefully capture that on film. So you need, yeah, you need a lot of prior research and a lot of like, we call it storyboarding, where you'll write out or draw out what's going to happen in each scene and then try and film the shots to match, which doesn't always happen, but is the idea. Mm, I feel like that would be really difficult in a natural history documentary where you're just kind of hoping that the animals will do as you expect based on that research and for the time you're filming they might not right yeah absolutely I had full intentions that I was going to film woodlice uh for my final film as like part of it a small section and I was like oh woodlice will be absolutely easy I'll just go to this forest that I was going to go to anyway for something else and I'll turn over a few logs and I'll film some woodlice what I didn't sort of factor in is that woodlice is quite boring from a visual <laughs> perspective uh-huh. like at the time I found I didn't find that many to be fair so that was already off a back burner and then they just you know they'd crawl around in the wood they're like quite cute in a way but they didn't they weren't doing anything there was no story so that that got scrapped in the end the woodlice did not make it into my final film because they weren't doing anything interesting enough but I'm sure if you spent a lot of time and you planned it better and you talked to woodlice experts, they would tell you when and where you could capture the key behaviour. I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I filmed butterflies instead. Who apparently are more interesting and have story and different behaviours, I guess, from what you were just saying. Yeah, much more interesting and much more visibly appealing. I mean, no offence to the woodlice, but beautiful orangey butterfly versus small, grey, tiny woodlice. We might even find them in our house. Butterflies don't tend to just wander into our house. Yeah, I'm, I have historically been a big woodlouse fan and I was like, yeah, this is my chance to show off the woodlice and I, I fluffed it. Not to get distracted, but why woodlice? What's so wonderful about them that you <laughs> would have conveyed in your documentary had you got some good footage of them? So the whole the whole idea was that my documentary was called From the Ground Up. So I started with species on the ground of which the woodlice was supposed to be the first species. And I was going to go up through the like, levels and habitats of the Yorkshire Dales until I got to the Peregrine Falcons at the top in the sky. That was the idea, but as with everything, the woodlice didn't work out and the, the story evolved from there <laughs> to not include the woodlice, which I still feel bad about to this day. Yeah, making documentaries is not a straight line. Telling a story is not necessarily where you think it will go. Well, if you watch any film or any you know, good plot, you have twists and turns. Yeah, finding that drama, that's something you aim for with scientists in the lab as well. So the documentary that I was doing was following these scientists from the United States as they went to Japan to use this um, this really niche piece of equipment to find out something about their samples that we, they would never know using any other method. And as the producer on the documentary, John, was saying, you need a bit of drama or some jeopardy. So the film crew kind of want something to go wrong during the experiments. Mm-hmm. And the scientists would obviously rather that didn't happen, that everything went perfectly. <laughs> but it does make a more interesting story when you get a bit of, oh, we've only got like 60 hours to do these experiments and we need every single hour that we've got. What if something goes wrong and we don't get any data? How can we pull this back? You definitely need drama to keep people watching. Like, if it had all gone perfectly... 10 scientists going from America to Japan to use a piece of equipment is not necessarily a story. It's interesting from a scientific point of view, and I'm sure what they found out would be interesting. But yeah, you need a hook, you need a draw, you need something a bit dangerous, a bit sexy to keep people watching it. Yeah, it does help. I guess the other way you could do it, because obviously 
all those scientists have got a real passion for what they're doing and a real interest. So if you can convey that in an exciting, sexy way, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that could also be quite compelling. What if you wanted calm TV, you know? Like ASMR is super popular on, on YouTube and it's just people doing normal things, but with the sound amplified. So what if we just went with those? Like some of the wildlife documentaries are just pretty nature imagery and they're just using the background or what about those kind of documentaries that just tell you the thing as it is you need a mix i think you need the nice calm beautiful sweeping drone shots of the mountains but then you also need the eagle carrying the goat over the cliff and dropping it and you need like a balance of drama and calm of chill because also they Mm -hmm. switch right so the if you think of a david attenborough It goes from, you know, um, the goats on the mountain and then it moves on over a sweeping mountain and then you're in Africa looking at elephants or you're in something else. So you need balance and you need moments and you need transitions to flow flow between. But yeah, you've got to to love a bit of drama. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the calm bits will appeal to someone, but the dramatic stuff might appeal to a wider audience. Yeah. And yeah, you're right in that you sort of you find the beats. Yeah, exactly. So you've got yeah, there's the slow bits that kind of let people take a breath, gives the documentary a chance to breathe. Again, as the producer was saying, I'm making it sound like I'm the expert and I just learned a lot mm-hmm. from the crew that I was with. Mm-hmm. But the beats is absolutely right. So when I did Secret Life of the Zoo, we had beat sheets, general beat sheets where we would write all the information and it would be four beats of the story or five, depending. But like the first beat is, you know. Tommy and Timmy live in a tank. That's beat one. They're brothers. They've been together forever. And then beat two is, oh, no, something's gone wrong. Beat three is, Tommy's going to die. What's going to happen? Timmy's going to be distraught. And then beat four (laughs) is, oh, no, they're all fine. He's had the medicine, you know. And it it works like that. It's the beats of the story. You're absolutely right. So I want to hear a bit more about Laura's experience with filming scientists, because not going to lie, it doesn't sound like it would be the most jeopardy filled drama if everything went well but how did you work that storyline in then something did go wrong ah. right at the start of the experiment and i was hanging out with the scientists so they were in a control room which is next to particle accelerator for simplicity we'll call it the particle accelerator um because i like talking about those Scientists are sitting at the control room and I'm sort of just chilling out, seeing what's happening. I've never been there before. I wanted to see what it was like. And they're like, we can't deliver a sample to where the photons exit from the particle accelerator and should scatter through our sample. We can't get any data in that case. We need to fix this. So I'm messaging the film crew. It's about midnight, by the way, saying things are going wrong. Come, come film. (laughs) Um, And then there had to be sort of, you know, a calming down overnight because no other staff are around to help out necessarily. What's going to happen? And then, is it fixed? How How's it been fixed? Does that mean we can proceed with the experiments? Or do we have to change something? So the jeopardy was there from the start. Mm. Uh, and it was also COVID times. There's a chance that someone could have caught COVID on the journey out. So that could have been a drama point as well. But you never really know until you get out there and you're filming it. You can storyboard it all you want, and you can hope that certain things will happen. But then when you get there... I guess there's a balance between telling it honestly and then if nothing dramatic has happened, maybe creating that drama somehow. Which I, I'm not too sure how we would have done it if something hadn't actually gone wrong. But there you go. Maybe in a future documentary that will happen and I could report back. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to watching that. It's like you said, when we did um, different episodes, I was filming an episode about a chameleon. It was going quite well and, you know, it was ticking along. And then the zookeeper said to me, oh, by the way, I'm going to put these lizards in the bottom of the chameleon. I mean, huge enclosure. Um, But don't worry about it. All they're going to do is run around the bottom. They won't interfere with anything. You know, they're quite quiet species. They'll probably just hide. So I was like, fine, yeah, whatever. Obviously, that's what you've got to do. And of course, these blooming quiet ground-dwelling lizards decided that they wanted to crawl up the trees, leap off the branches, you know, get in the way of the chameleon in just about every single sense of the word. (laughs) And my boss is going, why didn't you film the 
the lizards going in. You could have had the first reaction. You could have had a you know face off. And I was like, because they told me that they weren't going to be in the trees. They told me they were going to do nothing. So you can plan all you like, but you never know what the blooming lizards are going to do on day three. Film everything is my decision. Film everything and then discard the bits that aren't interesting. Which is easy to say when you've got a film crew and you don't have budget responsibility. Because we were at the zoo for so long, we had people on site the whole time. But with Laura's, it's very different. You need to figure out how to sift through that footage afterwards. I know the film crew said they recorded 25 hours of footage for, I said, 60 hours of experiment. Right. But there was also a lot of stuff like uh, people eating dinner or doing their laundry or going for a bike ride or something to chill out. Or shots of people not necessarily doing science, but talking about science. And again, there was beauty shots, the sort of the B-roll that has like sunsets in it and some of the wildlife that was on site and that sort of thing. <laughs> How long was your documentary in the end? We're aiming for 10 minutes. So we want something quite short and snappy that will hold people's attention. So yeah, 25 hours of footage for a 10 minute documentary. Yeah, that's a lot of content to get through. How did you sort of manage it? Did you start with a storyboard of what you wanted to get out of it? From what the crew was saying, it does make a lot of sense to have the storyboard to begin with. So you know kind of what you're aiming for. You can interview the scientists and ask particular questions to try and sort of almost get the response that you're looking for, but without putting words into their mouths. Because obviously they've not seen the storyboard and they don't know what you're aiming for. So they're just speaking really naturally. And then it is a case of, well, how does what they said fit into the storyline? Do we need to tweak it somehow? There's also the challenge of representing the science accurately, but still making it understandable to a wider audience. Because what these guys are doing is incredibly niche, and I could easily spend 10 minutes just trying to explain in detail what they were doing. But that's not the, the purpose of this documentary. The brief we were given was to make one of the scientists' grandparents understand or have awareness of what they were doing without rolling their eyes because some people just aren't that interested in science (laughs) (laughs) so then how do you get across just the exciting bit of the science without necessarily sacrificing accuracy in what you're talking about that is a real challenge and i've still not quite figured that out yet still a work in progress the documentary is not out yet still being edited whilst it's still in editing where will your documentary be We're initially aiming for YouTube, but then after that, who knows? Apparently, if enough people request something to be put on Netflix and it's on certain databases, Netflix will actually go and hunt it out and put it on their platform. That would be cool. It would. I didn't know they did that. Yeah. (laughs) I did some digging in preparation. (laughs) Where else could we put it? How many people is a lot of requests? Do we need like Mm. a couple of hundred thousand or? Probably, yeah. So I also don't know if it's nation specific because what is available in the US isn't necessarily available here. So I don't know quite how fine grained it is. It's just what I remember reading when I was looking into, well, where could we put it? But yeah, something like some thousands. Yeah. You're going to enter it into like uh, film festivals and stuff because that was a real push when we were doing our masters was that final films can be entered into like short film, film contests and film festivals. And then you can get fun awards and be be a bit extra snazzy but I mean I never did that because mine weren't any good (laughs) yes it's definitely something we are thinking about we'll try and nail down the dialogue first and then the guys are going to put in the the beauty shots and the animations of the science and then yeah we'll make a decision on what to do after that I want to watch it yeah how do you go about deciding what platform to put your films on I think with telly it's a bit different as something like Secret Life of the Zoo or Spring Watch because they've been going for so long, they're very, not easy, but they're very like well-known. And it's just a repeat. Basically, once you've done a series, people begin to get the idea of how it works. And yeah, changes will be made, but it's very repeatable. Like Spring Watch is essentially the same every year in that they film the animals. Michaela Strachan stands in a field and talks about barn owls and it's all very nice. And they go, yeah, they go to different locations, but it is, it is virtually the same. Whereas uh, something like Laura's is much more, you know, it's a one-off necessarily. It's a niche product. It's for a different audience as well. Like Spring Watch is on BBC prime time, probably has a few million people watch it every night. But also now in the digital age as well, like we didn't have Netflix and stuff when Spring Watch was first thought up 14, 15, 16 years ago. So there was no option to necessarily put it on YouTube or put it on Facebook 
or do anything like that. So yeah, it's really, really interesting to see. And Netflix has changed how people watch TV so much. Like I remember running home mm. to watch things because they were only on at five o'clock and that was it. And if you missed it, you missed it. You can binge watch Secret Life of the Zoo now, mm. can't you? And you couldn't do that before. So you could have all the animals. I strongly encourage everyone to binge watch <laughs> Secret Life of the Zoo. Especially which season? Oh gosh, I should know that. 16? <laughs> no. The episodes I did were filmed in 2019. So you can work backwards from there and work out which ones I was involved in. And my name is at the end, if anyone really wants to do a deep dive. My name is in the credits. So Ellie's obviously on a big production. How big was your team, Laura? It's pretty small. There was only three of us. So I was consulting to make sure the science was portrayed correctly and make sure we stuck to the brief. Okay. And we had um, a director, sort of, and a producer, sort of, but they were both doing camera operation as well. Mm -hmm. The producer was the person that came up with the storyline that we kind of tweaked a little bit to get the science in there. Okay. So it's only really three of us. And now back in the UK, going through edits, so we've got an editor as well. So four in total. And there are people working on a soundtrack. And that's it. How does that compare to, to when you were on Secret Life of the Zoo, for example, Ellie? We definitely had more, I would say. We had at least four camera operators. And then there were four researchers at one point or three researchers and uh, assistant producer. Then we had the series producer, story producer. We had a tech guy, someone in charge of copying all the footage. So the camera people would go out, film the chimps, film the elephants, film the giraffe, film whatever, come back and then give their camera cards to the data wrangler, who would then copy all the data from the cards onto the mainframe. And then that would get sent physically in a hard drive to London to the edit. So the edit was ongoing while we were still shooting. So we started February and I think maybe the edit started April. So we were shipping footage like, and they were editing it as we could get it in. And we get a message from the edit being like, oh, do you mind just going back and filming that tortoise again? Because we really like it to do this. Or <laughs> can you just ask that zookeeper if they'll say this? And yeah, we had, I had a lot of conversations where I was like, so you know that thing we did three weeks ago? Can we do it again? <laughs> because it's not quite right for the edit. So yeah, we had a team. I mean, a real team. Mm. And you could watch the credits and add them all up. But I mean, easily 25, maybe 30 people. And yeah, people I never met as well, because I was on location in the zoo. And the editors were all down in London. The execs would come up, not very often, maybe every two or three months to see, make sure everything was going okay. But yeah, I mean, mm. lots of people to make that show. Is Data Wrangler an actual job title in the credits? Is that what they call yeah. it? Wow. Yeah. I like that. That was my <laughs> question too. <laughs> that is a really, really important slash stressful job. I would hate to be a Data Wrangler because if it goes wrong, you've lost all of that work and not necessarily through your fault. I mean, technical problems happen a lot, but and the problem is, what I would find the most stressful is that lovely Jess, who was our data wrangler, she had a box of like in cards and out cards. So you put the card into the inbox, Jess puts it in the computer, copies the data, puts it in the out box, and then that card goes back to the camera operators and then they wipe the footage so that you can keep reusing the cards. Otherwise you need loads and loads and loads. And that would just scare me so much. Like imagine if it hadn't copied and then they put it in back in the camera and they format the card and that footage is white, like, oh, oh, it gives me hives thinking about it. Yeah, I think that would make me a bit paranoid as well. You'd be constantly checking, is that the right card? Do I definitely send it out to someone to reuse? Yeah, exactly. So you have to be super organised. Like, it's a really good job and it's a good way in. If you want to be a camera op, that's quite a lot of where people start is data wrangling and like technical assistant, camera assistant roles is all kind of sort of similar and you can go, go on from there. And would you say... It was kind of a similar setup with Springwatch because that's quite established as well. Springwatch was a little bit different because it was still COVID. So we had much less people than would normally have been there. And I was story developing. So I was in charge of like watching cameras for, we did 12 hour shifts or 10 hour shifts. I can't remember now. But I sat basically in a hut all day and watched cameras of wildlife for extended periods and recorded clips to then send back to the edit so in, we didn't have a data wrangler in the same way because we were clipping the clips it was like an inbuilt system sort of thing um so yeah but that that would have been more and there were teams because we were in again on location in Norfolk 
there were then teams in Bristol editing. There was a team that was doing like wider research because Springwatch is also live. So then we had the live team. So we had like a sound person, camera people, all of that, but it's also made up of VTs, videotapes, they're still called, where people would have gone out months prior and filmed a little three or four minute clip about, I don't know, bats or, or something nice, otters. But that would have been done by a completely separate team sometimes. So you can have like little elements that would have been filmed by like a Laura sized team of three or four people that then feed into our show. So it gets bigger and bigger because the show is so big. But yeah, I would say Spring Watch was surprisingly few given how established it was, but that was mainly a COVID, a COVID thing. There were still a lot of people working on it. They just weren't all in one place at one time. Yeah, those live elements would make it, I guess, more interesting and also more stressful to film because you need timings to happen. You need things to line up at the right time, right? You say, right, go to this thing now. Or, oh, there's some sort of crisis going on in that location. Let's not go there. Let's have a backup plan. Yeah, so we would have someone, I can't remember what they're technically called, what their job title is, but there's someone counting. So they have sheets and sheets. So you do rehearsal and then you have sheets and sheets of the order, the running order of the show. And you'll say there'll be a, someone in the ear of the presenter being like five seconds till live, four seconds till live, <laughs> three seconds till live. And it literally counts like that. Gosh. And then Chris Packham is like, good evening and welcome to Spring Watch. And then it's like, we've got 30 seconds on this and we're rolling and we're still going. And then three seconds to the VT. And now we're going to a VT of Potters in thing. Play the VT, VT runs for three minutes and then 30 seconds out. And then, and it goes on and on all for an hour. And then right at the end, they're like, and we're clear. And everyone breathes a huge sigh of because you're not live on the BBC at eight o'clock prime time with the nation watching. Oh my god! But no, it is an, um, to go to a live TV set on location or in a studio is such a rush. It's so fun. And when I did um, Steps, which is a studio live studio show, which is still on Steps Back Lunch uh, Channel Four, the amount of things that you can do in a three minute ad break is incredible. Like the team are so good. And you can clear whole sets and you can bring in, you know, Farmer John and his 10 alpacas or, you know, an entire team of dancers or anything because people are so on it and they're so all about the timings and you only have three minutes to get everyone on before you're back live on air. So, yeah, it's really fun. If you like being in a fast paced environment, live TV is the place for you. It's so stressful as well. The amount of running I did on that show was ridiculous. <laughs> uh, you'd be super fit, though. Oh, yeah. 10,000 steps a day, easy. <laughs> oh, I can sense a career change coming on for me now. I'm going to transition into doing live TV behind the scenes. <laughs> it's so good. I mean, that, that show is, is a lot of people as well. Because you have all the crew doing the cameras, and then you have what's called a gallery. So you'll see there'll be like maybe four, five, six people in the gallery watching the show as it goes out and the director will be in the gallery being like okay cut to camera three cut to this and close up on this guy and this so it's all this sort of back chatter that you would never hear when you're watching the show but people are are doing it all the time and then of course there's like a props team and a set team and a art department and all of that to to make a studio show is quite different to a wildlife show but it's the same principle in that there's a lot of people, a lot of moving parts to make it to make it off the ground. It's good fun. Yeah, I feel like we need to combine this with some way of doing science documentaries. So you've got, like, I don't know, like sort of scientists in different parts of the world trying to do the same experiment at the same time and like racing each other to get to the result first while someone in the studio <laughs> is commentating on it. <laughs> Almost like the Olympics of a science experiment, whichever one finishes first or gets the best result. You know, is that your vision for it? Oh, I have no idea. I mean, how do you define the best result? It depends on what you're looking for, right? It could, it could be like the most accurate structure of this crystal ever, or it could be, I don't know, finding the least harmful way to cure a particular cancer, falling back on one of our previous episodes. I don't know. I don't know what it could be. It's a work in progress. But it also has to be something you could do live. Live is stressful. I recommend no one does anything live. <laughs> if I had my way, we'd all pre-record everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it'd be more interesting, though. You'd get some genuine reactions of scientists just 
getting really fed up with something and throwing tools across the room or getting really excited when something does work and jumping up and down, which you couldn't really see in our documentary because we're all wearing face masks because of COVID. So the producer's like, guys, next time you get some um, some results on the screen, can you all just like wave your arms around or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, telling people that aren't um, actors or aren't telly presenters to be animated on camera is difficult to like get people to genuinely react. Like when we had it a little bit at the zoo because they are zookeepers, like that is their job. They're not actors, they're not television professionals. So yeah, to get genuine reactions is difficult and to get someone to repeat something in the same animated manner is sometimes extremely hard. They were all lovely and very, very good to work with. What would you say is the, is the way in to, if that is something that people are interested in, in, in storytelling with a visual or video medium? I think if you want to work in telly, then there's lots of ways in, but most people would start as a runner. And that involves basically emailing. Running. <laughs> yeah, sometimes actually physically running, but mainly um, emailing production companies and saying, this is who I am. This is what I'm interested in. This is what I can do. I really love that show you made about Japanese scientists. I'd love to work on something like that. Have you got any availability for a runner in London? And that's how lots of people get jobs, is emailing talent managers and producers at those companies and being like, please hire me and here's my CV and I can drive and I'm, you know, I've got a master's in this or I've got a degree in that or I just really am passionate about cars or engineering or anything. Most people would start as a runner. Mm -hmm. You can also do a degree in any subject, really, and then go into telly that way and say, I love art or I love history and I want to be involved in that sort of a show. But Laura's ones is much more niche. I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> know how you got to that point. Um, sometimes I'm not entirely sure. I think it was more just having a passion of science communication and talking to other people about their work. Because when I was asked, like, could we do a documentary about this research? They said it was because I was interested and I was keen that they asked me about it. Hmm. I mean, that came about because I interviewed them for someone else's podcast and then I wrote a blog about their work and then I just kept talking to them, not pestering them, just kind of having this conversation like, well, is what is what I've written, is that right? Could we phrase that any better? Or can I do another one about a different aspect of your work? So if you're interested in just science communication, you can easily start your own blog. You can easily start your own podcast. And then it's just about making connections and talking to people and just finding someone that's interested or has some funding or has some science that they want to talk about and you can make that collaboration happen. David Attenborough used to say there's no excuse. Like everyone's got a smartphone now. You don't need millions of pounds worth of fancy equipment or the best camera or audio setup. You can record your friend on your phone talking about wombats or engineering or nuclear fusion and, you know, post that on YouTube or post it on Instagram or TikTok or anything. You know, it can be very quick and straightforward. It doesn't have to be a big BBC production or even a 10-minute documentary. It can be a 30-second TikTok is still is still valid science communication. Yeah, and there are, what, thousands and thousands of videos out there on YouTube and TikTok and wherever else of people doing something similar. So you can pick, like, which one of those do I like and which bits of it would I want to do something similar as in my own style of communication. Yeah. Like, so if you look at what they do, how do they introduce it? How do they talk about their results or whatever it is? How do they conclude it? Do they have introductory music? Do they have outtakes at the end? Something that's become quite a trend is life hacks or science hacks, or they seem to be based on science and then they're wrong. What do you think is the sort of role as well of like being truthful versus entertainment or monetization? I think you have to think about what you're trying to do. Are you trying to tell someone three facts about wombats, let's say, in which case you need to make sure that those facts are right. But also if it's just you on TikTok messing around, no one's going to hold you accountable necessarily. You might get some comments saying, oh, wombats don't have six legs, what are you on about? But <laughs> ne nothing necessarily bad is going to happen apart from some comments about what you're saying. But if you're doing it on a huge scale, like the BBC or Laura's um documentary you want to make that right because it's your credibility it's your reputation or the reputation of the company that's on the line so yeah obviously companies have a sort of desire to protect themselves but if you're showing something to millions of people chances are at least one of those people is going to be like that's not right 
and then that's where you get sort of complaints and all of that sort of thing but yeah there is a lot of misinformation out there there's a lot of fake science is not really the right word but you know what I mean in that you can say anything online and it's up to you what you believe yeah and I would say anything you see here or read on the internet you should question does that seem correct how can I fact check that so if you watch one TikTok video talking about wombats then you look up what do wombats do and a lot of those facts that were mentioned on TikTok are in there then you know chances are that person was just doing some sort of entertaining video that wasn't necessarily factually correct and they'll just kind of lose credibility so just I, personally I wouldn't pay attention to them because they're peddling untruths and you can fact check stuff pretty easily I mean the internet is a pretty incredible resource in that you can google you know typical behaviors of a wombat and get loads of response and if three or more are saying a similar thing then you've got a pretty good idea of what's actually likely to be happening and what's not yeah or if you know a wombat expert or can find a wombat expert at a university or a zoo or elsewhere <laughs> that always helps <laughs> i really hope there are wombat experts out there just waiting to be asked just hoping to to stop the spread of wombat disinformation yeah because anyone if they love their research and they love their wombats they'll want to talk about their wombats absolutely <laughs> so i think that's a good place to leave it we've covered a lot of what it takes to make a documentary about how you got into it and also how else you might suggest others to follow a similar path if you like this conversation or any of the other ones come find us on social media it'd be great to hear your experience or views on what we've discussed and also have a listen to our other episodes so this is the last episode for 2022 really happy to end the year on the note that we've reached 5,000 downloads Thank you all for sharing it with your friends, family, students, teachers, and uh, we'll hope to have a great 2023. We've got lots planned, and I hope you have a good rest of your year. Thank you. Bye. Bye. The views expressed in this podcast belong entirely to the person that said them. They do not represent any industry or organisation. If you enjoyed listening to these views, it would really help us out if you could rate us, leave a review and tell a friend. This podcast was sponsored by no one, but if you're interested in funding us to continue to have frank discussions about science and engineering, please get in touch.